Welcome to Hope at Night, featuring Andrew Ritland, Richard Davidson, Q&A with our live audience, and host, Anil Kanda. Today's episode, Is True Justice Possible? And here's your host, Anil Kanda. Welcome to another episode of Hope at Night. If you've ever hung out with a toddler, you will know they have a strong, innate sense of justice. You just need to give a two-year-old one cookie and his friend two cookies, and I can guarantee you'll be met with indignant wails of injustice before them. Sometimes we are on the receiving end of injustice, but sometimes we are the perpetrators. In this universe, can we ever be sure there is true justice? Does God care about justice? In today's discussion about justice, we'll first be meeting with a prosecutor from the state of Iowa. Please welcome to Hope at Night, Andrew Ritland. Andrew, glad you're here. Well, thank you. I enjoyed my uh, drive out here. Now, how long have you been a state prosecutor for? I've been a prosecutor for going on 13 years. 13 years. That's right. Uh, so I handle every kind of offense from arson, burglary, homicide, sexual abuse, uh, all, the, all the top crimes, I guess. Okay, how many fel felony cases have you handled? You know, I, had, I did total up at one point. I was over 1,000, and then I kind of lost count. Over a thousand? Yeah, they kind of blur together at some point. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Do you enjoy your work, Andrew? Is it difficult? I do enjoy my work, though it is difficult at times. Uh, you know, a lot of times people want to help others, and they think about, you know, service, you know, going out to the community. Uh, but one way you can really help is kind of what I do in the criminal justice system. Uh, though it is can be very taxing. I mean, you deal with a lot of tragedy. Uh, there's not a lot of happy days, unfortunately, in, in what I do. Even when you hold the guilty accountable, uh, it's still not something you necessarily celebrate. Uh, it's still something that can be uh, hard to deal with. What have been some of the most difficult cases you've handled? I would say the most difficult cases are one involving children. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes we can put ourselves in situations that unfortunately, you know, lead to uh, us being in you know, bad spots. Uh, but with kids, you know, they are so innocent and so um, vulnerable. And people who take advantage of that uh, can be very, very tragic. So those are the hardest cases. Do you take your work home with you? Is there an emotional load that you, when you go home, it's still weighing upon you? It, it robs your night of good sleep? Well, in my line of work, you really can't take it home. If you do, you won't last very long. Right. Actually, my predecessor only lasted six months in my position uh, because she had to deal with a child homicide sort of situation, uh, which I ultimately had to inherit. Uh, but it, it's a situation where you have to be able to emotionally disconnect uh, the tragedy that you see on a day-to-day -day basis from, you know, your home life. Because uh, if you do, you won't last very long. Wow. What, what do you think are the biggest limitations to our current legal system? Well, I think there's two, two problems. One is our knowledge is always going to be imperfect. We never truly know uh, what uh, happened in a situation, uh, and even if we have a video camera going to show what someone did, we never truly know the intent of the heart. Uh, so many crimes uh, hinge on what someone was thinking at the time, and that can always be difficult. So we have a problem with not knowing all the facts. Uh, but even if we were to know all the facts, uh, the laws themselves aren't always crafted to meet every uh, situation, every tragic situation. So uh, you find that there are some things that are wrong but not illegal or immoral but not illegal uh, and the law just doesn't catch every single situation. So I think we have a deficiency in our knowledge but also deficiency in cr trying to criminalize or to make rules against certain type of behavior. So educate me here a little bit. When there is more information that's presented to you, uh, when, when you come across a case and you just have absolutely all the evidence in the world, this person is guilty, or let's say it's the opposite, maybe you don't have a lot of evidence that this person is guilty. Being a prosecutor, mm -hmm. 
do you intensify your energy based upon what you believe is is enough for that person? Well, I would say what I really enjoy about criminal prosecution, which is unique among any uh, other sort of legal profession, is I am charged with doing justice. Like that literally is in my, my job title. Uh, I am uh, supposed to be guided by a sense of doing what is right in every situation. So for example, if someone's arrested uh, and I don't believe they committed the crime, uh, I am obligated to dismiss that. I, I, I'm under an oath uh, to make sure that no uh, innocent is punished. But on the flip side, uh, I'm also charged with making sure no guilty is goes away, right? That they're each held accountable uh, for their actions. So uh, sometimes it can be very difficult because you can understand that a person may have committed a crime, uh, but there may not be sufficient admissible evidence to prove it. Uh, sometimes the legal system doesn't allow every fact to come in for a jury. So there's some cases which I know they have committed the crime, but I have to dismiss because I know I won't be able to prove it uh, based on what's going to be admissible in court. You see what I'm saying? Right. So as a prosecutor, there is a, a sense of morality and ethics that are expected. Would you say that's correct? Do they give you a class on ethics on how to be a good prosecutor? Or is that something you, uh, you just sort of develop over time? Uh, it's something that you have to develop. Um, you have to have an inward compass, so to speak, as to what's right and wrong. Um, I've always said that of any uh, player in the legal system, uh, the one you don't want to be corrupted is a prosecutor. Uh, they can do more damage than a corrupt judge, a corrupt defense attorney, a bad juror, uh, because a prosecutor really wields the sword of the state. Uh, you can bring charges that, if convicted, the judge has no option but to send them to prison. Uh, likewise, uh, as a prosecutor, uh, if I dismiss a charge, they can never be charged again. They can uh, forever be uh, free of that uh, criminal charge. So uh, a prosecutor has to be one of, uh, of ethics and a strong moral compass uh, because they really do hold the, the weight of the justice system in their hands. Right. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, as much you're able to share, what has been the most difficult case you've handled? One that still uh, ruminates in your mind, one that still you think about sometimes, what would you say that is? I would say the most difficult case is one in which a child had been uh, abused, sexually abused, for over 10 years. Uh, and she described that abuse as something that was so common and started so early that she didn't even recognize what was happening to her. Like, it became normalized to her. And it's so tragic when the people you love the most are the ones that hurt you the greatest. Wow. And you can see when you when you talk to her, she was struggling. You know, what did I do that uh, made this happen to me? Like, even as a child, they're, they're trying to understand why this is happening to them. You know, they're struggling with very deep questions, uh, and there's not always a satisfactory answer on this earth. Uh, those are the cases that kind of stick with you. You know, right. those are the cases you wish you really could, you know, rewrite the past right. to avoid right. that harm. Andrew, you know, as you're working with people, as you, you're, you're getting all the information, you're gathering evidence with each crime, and you look at a person and you think about the circumstances that shape that person, Perhaps it's the cycles that they were caught up in that, that led them down a particular path. And then you got people who are just, I mean, just downright, they've committed a crime. How do you navigate through that? It, it, there just seems to be a lot of limitations on that and a lot of challenges. But you as a prosecutor, how do you discern, wait a minute, is, is this a person who is simply the product of cycles and, and there is, uh, there, there's hope of redemption here? Versus like, okay, no, this person just downright knew what was right and committed evil. Well, I think it's very true that we all don't start at the same starting line. You know, there are people who have challenges uh, at a young age that people who live their whole lives don't go through what they've gone through, right? Uh, we we see, even in, in my line of work, where you find that, you know, they have been abused themselves or they've had difficult trying circumstances and they go into the lifestyle which they themselves have seen through their parents or, or grandparents. Uh, you, you definitely can see that, how uh, sins can be passed down, so to speak, from the third and fourth generation. Uh, but then you do find people who just have a desire to do what's wrong, right? I mean, uh, they are um, 
so bent on uh, their own uh, ways that there's nothing you can do for them, right? So as a prosecutor, I try to give people the opportunity to prove what road they've gone down. Like, what, are you on the road of I made a mistake and now I can be reformed and, and be a productive member of society? Or is this now a part of my character uh, that it's such that there's nothing we can incentivize? And, and some of the most challenging cases, quite frankly, are those when you have uh, very violent crimes with very young offenders. Mm. So let's say you have a 16 or 17 year old who commits a very violent crime. Uh, it's difficult to know if that uh, adolescent, young adult has decided a, in a life of crime, or is this a manifestation of a developing brain that they haven't been mature enough, don't have the right. um, ability to check their own emotions? Uh, and those can be very hard because, you know, if you make the wrong call, you can let potentially a violent person out to harm others. But on the other hand, uh, if this was uh, an aberrant situation, you could uh, put them in prison for a very long time and that could ultimately make them worse and not make society any safer. That's challenging. You know, when you're reading the Bible and you read about God, you read about the courtroom, you read about uh, legal language that's in scripture, you know, our advocate, you read this and, and you're in the midst of it what goes through your mind as you're reading scripture? Well, I think that God is uh, a God of justice, and I thank God for that, because justice on this earth will always be incomplete. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll always have um, uh, gaps, we'll always have problems in our legal system. And ultimately, even if the right person's convicted and they go to prison, uh, that still doesn't repair the breach, right? I mean, right. We're, we're punishing the person for what they've done, but that doesn't restore the person who is harmed. You know, so as I read through scripture, uh, I have hope uh, that no matter the deficiencies I see on this earth in the justice system, uh, that uh, one day we'll finally have that true justice to every person. And I think a lot of times people will struggle uh, with God because of that issue, because of justice, right? Because they say, you know, if God is loving, if he's just, how can they be tortured forever, right? right. How can that be a just outcome? On this earth, we recognize that there shouldn't be a, a cruel and unusual punishment, a uh, constitutional right against that. Uh, and they say, well, if we recognize, if we have the sense of justice, how can God be something like that, you see? Right. So having a true understanding of what it means, what, what biblical or divine justice is, can really help us understand uh, who God is and what he's trying to do for us. Wow. This has been really fascinating and educating for me. Appreciate that, Andrew. Thank you so much for sharing with us. I uh, appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Well, we've been talking with state prosecutor Andrew Ritlin. For our next segment, we'll dig deeper with a theologian and professor and author into the concept of an end time judgment. And if that is good news or something to be afraid of. We'll be right back after this break, so don't go away. Welcome back to Hope at Night. We've been talking with State Prosecutor Andrew Ritlin earlier to get an idea of his experience in the courtroom and what we can learn as it relates to the idea of God as the ultimate judge. We're going to explore the biblical concept of an end time judgment more and if that is good news or something to be afraid of. Helping us with that discussion is a professor, theologian, and author who has written a lot about the concept of judgment. Please welcome to Hope at Night, Dr. Richard Davidson. So we have been talking about the justice system. Uh, we've been talking about the legal system. And, and now this discussion about the biblical view of judgment. Does the Bible really talk about judgment? You know, if you start with the book of Genesis and go to Revelation, you'll find hundreds of references to judgment. Uh, could you give me some? I actually counted over 300 times where God is bringing a legal case, a judgment case uh, in connection. Starts in Genesis 3, uh, where Adam and Eve, they sin and God uh, 
puts them on the uh, witness seat and starts asking them questions. And in the process of the cross-examination, they are perjuring themselves. And God has to give this, the, the verdict of guilty and the sentence of death. But before that sentence is given, he gives the hope of salvation. Mm. And so what I find is, yes, judgment is everywhere through scripture, divine judgment, but the gospel is in the middle of each one of those. Dr. Davidson, and I, I appreciate what you're saying. You know, we, we talk about judgment and we talk about God who knows all things. He, he knows every situation, every circumstance, every detail, every scenario. Why in the world does he need a judgment? That is a very good question. And the fact is, God knows who are his. God knows every detail about us. The judgment is not for him to learn something. The judgment already starting in Genesis and all 300 of those references is because God is a God who is transparent. Mm. God is a God who wants people to know that he is fair, that he is just, that he's not arbitrary, a stern and harsh and all of those things I had wrong when I was growing up as a Christian, believing in the Bible, but totally misunderstanding the judgment. The, the word judgment can elicit some fears and it some was, negative feelings. Yes, every time I went to a meeting and they were talking about judgment, I went away depressed. I went away saying, man, I can never be good enough to stand up before the judge. How could I, how could I possibly? And so I became terrified of the judgment. And as a pastor, I refused to preach about the judgment because right. it was bad news to me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch the subject for years. Right, right. Sinners in the hands of an angry that's God. Right. We all know that that's, sermon title, that's right? That's right. That's right. And then uh, fortunately, uh, during a series of meetings, I went through this beautiful book by C.S. Lewis on reflections on the Psalms. I love C.S. Lewis. And uh, I went through every chapter with this group, except for the one on judgment. I didn't want to talk about it. Then my conscience smote me and I say, maybe I better take a, a second look at the subject of judgment. And so I started with the book of Psalms and I decided I'd read the whole book of Psalms. So I got to, yeah, I got to Psalm seven and I found the first reverence to judgment and it blew me away because David is praying. Oh yeah, he says the Lord will judge the people, but then he says, judge me, O Lord, judge me. It's like David is saying, bring it on, Lord, I can hardly wait. And we're talking about David here. David, the sinner who not only thought about committing, uh, breaking all the Ten Commandments, but actually broke them, right. including adultery and including lying and including murder and all the rest. And yet David welcomed the judgment. I just couldn't believe what I was reading. And so that led me to search deeper into the Bible to see what it really had to say about judgment that David could find as good news. So let's break this down a little bit more. How is the judgment that's found in the Bible differ? How does it, how is it different than the, the legal system uh, that, that's in our world today? Yeah, well, fortunately we have an expert in that <laughs> so he can help me if I'm saying anything or not, not adding something. But uh, basically uh, for for us today to look at the way judgment happened in the city gates, we would be kind of aghast because here you got these group of elders that represent all the phases of judgment and they are involved in all of them. So they can call the case to order. They can call witnesses. They can testify themselves and be witnesses. They can act, act as a prosecution. They can act as a defense, asking questions. And then they act as the judge. Sounds like a, a total chaos system, but it's not because the judicial system is these judges are on the side of the person that is there in the community and they, they want to redeem them. They will take all the steps to be on his side and still be fair and, 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 and carry out justice. And God knows already he doesn't need the judgment. Whereas in our human judgments in the Western system, uh, the judge, needs to understand and needs to hear the evidence uh, as well as needs for those who are looking on to know that he's fair. So as a believer who is reading the Bible and studying the scriptures, why should we not be afraid of the judgment of God? Yeah, well, the first thing that I discovered that caused me to maybe rethink 
whether I should be afraid, is that you look at the Hebrew word and the Greek word for judge in the Bible, and you look at what it means, and its basic meaning is to save, hmm. to deliver, wow. to vindicate, to justify. That's what it's basically about. You've got a whole book called the Book of Judges, Right. When people are in trouble, God raises up a judge to deliver them. They were all deliverers. <laughs> That's right. They were deliverers. And it's only for those who don't accept God's gift of salvation and of vindication and all that then they get the opposite side, which is condemnation. But God's judgment is, I want to be on your side. I want to save you. So when David was praying, judge me, O Lord, he was asking for justice. He was asking for help. He was asking That's for right. deliverance. That's right. The, the situation where David has these prayers in the early part of the Psalms is a situation in which um, Saul, who was the king, had accused Dave, David of taking over the throne, of trying to usurp the throne. So Saul was a malicious witness against David, accusing him of a crime he didn't commit. And so David was out in the wilderness running from King Saul and his army, not sure whether he would be alive the next day. Mm -hmm. And he's praying, Lord, here is this man that is accusing me falsely, and here I am running from him, don't know whether I'm going to live. Help me. Deliver me, God. Judge me. <laughs> Save me. Vindicate me. Is justice according to the scriptures, different than mercy? Well, as I understand it, God is love. And love, someone has said, I don't know who to attribute this to, love has two daughters, justice and mercy. So for example, uh, I, my favorite part of the Bible is the Pentateuch, the Torah. And I'm just finishing a commentary in the book of Exodus. And so I've been enthralled with the story of the Exodus. And when you get to the climax of the story, you've got uh, God calling Moses up on the mountain because Moses says, God, I want to know more about you. Tell me more about your glory. Show me your glory, your character. Tell me who you are. And so God gives the clearest description of who he is in all the Bible. And it's in Exodus 34 when he says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands. That's mercy. All of those are the attributes of mercy. And it continues, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So the preponderance of God's character is his mercy side. But he adds, but by the way, but by no means clearing the guilty and visiting the sin of the fathers unto the children unto the third and fourth generation, the consequences of sin. So I see God as predisposed toward mercy, okay. but justice comes when his holiness has to deal with sin. Right, right. You know, when you think about eternity and you think about this time where, where God will make all things uh, clear to the redeemed, uh, yeah. the books were open, right? Yeah. The Bible says, right? And, yeah. and, and there's, a, there's a time of transparency with God, you know? Uh, how does one understand that, that future judgment? How does one, how does one navigate through those issues um, and, tr and try to understand how, how God sees things? I mean, you literally have the story of God saving some of the most horrendous people in Scripture. Uh, he, he's saving kings like King Manasseh, yeah. you know, he, he, people like David, where there was obviously adultery and then the, the murder of of uh, Uriah, you know, he, he's saving people like Paul, who was Saul, who actually led to the, you know, persecuting of, of Christians. How do we see justice? How are we supposed to see justice uh, when, when God is saving a, a, a bunch of no good people? Yeah. Well, the, the, to me, the cool thing about end time judgment is that we usually talk about it way too late in history because according to the Bible, the last days started when Jesus came. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 1 says, in these last days, he is spoken by his son. And when Jesus came, he said, now is this world judged. Mm -hmm. And when Jesus died on the cross, he bore the shame, the guilt, the anguish 
for this entire world. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, we all became sinners. We were born sinners. Right. We're born hopeless. And we can't, I don't, in the ju judicial system today, we usually can't have a human being dying for another human being, right? <laughs> but in this case, yeah. it's God. It's, it's the creator who is the one who, who made us. We are his property. We are his children. And he dares to die there to take the guilt, to take the punishment for what we deserve. He doesn't remove justice. He doesn't remove. He directs it, it towards himself. He directs it toward himself, exactly. And so this, this end time judgment that we talk about that's still future from now has to always be seen in light of the primary judgment, which was sin was judged on the cross in Jesus. And he doesn't make cheap grace because the ones he forgives are the ones that come to see by looking at what he did on the cross. They see how wretched they are. They see all the terrible things they have done to their fellow humans and their heart is, is broken. That's why David says, a broken, a contrite heart you will not despise. So it's not cheap grace. A, a look at Calvary breaks our hearts hmm. and then we are different people. Uh, Dr. Davidson, let me follow up. Y you're talking about the cross, you're talking about the gospel, and you're talking about how the justice that was meant for us was directed upon Jesus, upon our yeah. Savior. How does one man dying satisfy the justice for the, all, the, all the world? Yeah. How does one individual taking the, the sins of the world, the penalty of sin upon him, how does that satisfy and open up redemption for the world to be possibly saved? Yeah, that's one of the great questions that theologians have wrestled with. <laughs> right. and, uh, I'm glad I'm talking it's, to one. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's not a simple answer, but for me, it's not enough to say one person because no person, no person but God himself could have done that. No angel could have died for us. You could not die for me, for my sins, but the God who created us, the God who is justice, the God who is mercy, the God who is love, for him to give up his son and his son to make that, that taking of the penalty, it is enough, it is more than enough. Mm -hmm. It is enough to cover the guilt and the shame of the entire world, even those who don't accept it. Right, and we're talking about the, the lawgiver himself. We're talking about God That's right. who, who stepped into humanity, right? So God has this difficulty. He wants to save us, but he also is just. Right. And this is the great mystery of the gospel that's at the heart of the book of Romans, that by the sacrifice of Jesus, he remains just and the justifier of those who believe in him. And God does not remove justice, that's right? right? And, and that's the right. gospel opens up on the door for him to, to, to keep justice and to maintain justice while justifying the sinner, the guilty, that's the right. broken. That's right. Wow, that's fantastic. So in light of this, and Andrew, feel free to chime in as well. Uh, when you're hearing the gospel, you're reading about the gospel, what does this teach us about how we are to administer justice here? Now, we may not be called to be a state prosecutor like Andrew, but in everyday life, what does this teach us about justice on a practical level? Well, I think we should understand that we have to approach this topic with a lot of humility <clears throat> because we always want the other person to get their due, right? right. You know, Lord, you know, give, judge them. Uh, but we have to recognize that we are often guilty of the same or similar sins, right? So no one is better than anyone else. So when we approach, uh, you know, another person who has wronged us, we should approach it as Christ did, uh, wanting to save that other person, right? We sh if we come um, at another person with the idea of, well, I'm going to show them what's wrong and I'm going to, you know, lay down the law, that's not God's approach. I mean, God is merciful even with a sinner, he's merciful. You know, even those who are ultimately going to be destroyed in the end judgment, that is a form of mercy to them, right? So when we deal with others, we have to show that same sort of mercy and show that same sort of love. Uh, 
because if we want to uh, be doers of justice, right, as we're called to do, uh, we need to have that love for others. God says many times, I am just. And just as many times, he says, I look at the world and I see justice has fallen in the street and it pains him. God has a passion for justice. And so the prophets are filled with calls for people to come back and do justly. In fact, the summary in Micah, the best summary of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, is right there in Micah chapter 6. He has shown you, O oh, oh man, what is good, but to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. Mm. So uh, God gives a call through the prophets, He gives a call through Jesus to, uh, to stand for the, for the oppressed, to stand for everything we can do on this earth and then ultimately to point people to where they can get full, impartial and full justice at the end of time. Right, and you do see a lot of laws in the Old Testament where it does talk about to do, to do justice to the widow, to the That's orphan, right. to the oppressed. Uh, there seems to be an obligation from Scripture to, yeah. to help those that are in need, and not just the homeless person, but to those that are, that are products of, of unjust systems. That's right. there, there's a call to the believer to do something about it, to, yeah. to help out yeah. in that situation. Yeah. Wow, this has been a, a fantastic discussion, and I, I really appreciate I just feel, again, we're just scratching the surface here, but man, this is amazing. Well, it's time to go to a break, but when we come back, we'll get to hear some questions from our live audience for our guest tonight, so don't go away. Welcome back to Hope at Night. We've been talking about the concepts of justice and judgment with our guest, State Prosecutor Andrew Ritland, and theologian, professor, and author, Dr. Richard Davidson. I'd like to turn to our live in-studio audience. We have any questions? Right over there. Hello. Um, if God is all-knowing, um, what's the point of holding a trial? The trial isn't for uh, God's benefit. It's for our benefit, right? We clearly don't know the inner thoughts of anyone on this earth, right? Uh, we could see someone who from the outside looks like, you know, they are doing God's will, who are following his leading, but inside they could be corrupt. I mean, for example, look at the Pharisees in scripture, the religious leaders of the day, uh, they had the outward appearance of doing what God wanted, but inwardly they were wicked, right? So, the end time judgment is for our benefit to know how God is going to be fair. Because just imagine if you were in heaven and you saw someone who thought, why is this guy here? Like, I know why I got in here, but how did this guy get in, right? You want to know well, how God are you just allowing this in here? Well, God allows us to see his work, so to speak. He allows us to see the process he went through. So uh, we can look and, and see that God, yeah, he was just because knowing what I know, knowing what God knows, he came to the right conclusion. So it's really for us. Wow. Dr. Davidson, how, what would you add to that? I would say that I agree fully, and I would simply parse it a little bit more by showing that God has d several phases of judgment, and each one is to help a different group of people in the universe understand. So the judgment that is going on before Christ comes uh, helps uh, to be able to, to show the, the universe, the unfallen universe, the angels, who who should be coming to heaven, who is safe to save, that we'd want around in the neighborhood and who not. And so they were able to see the evidence. Imagine if, if God carried out all of his actions unilaterally without any kind of opinion or input, then he would be operating as a tyrant. Right. Uh, there'd be no understanding of his ways and his wills. But it, it almost sounds like in some sense, there is a monarchy, the way that God runs his universe, but it also seems to be almost a, a kind of form of democracy as well. Yes. So He wants to carry the universe along with him so that at the end of time, everyone will shout out, just and true are your ways, O King of Saints. Uh, that's right. So and, and, and our world, in our universe, I should say, is, is watching and beholding the actions of God. 
this idea of a trial seems to clarify ideas of controversy. Uh, God's actions before he acts, uh, he wants to make sure the rest of the universe is on board. Would you say that's correct? He wants everyone to see that he's done everything he can to save everyone he can because he's in the business of saving people. And those who have not been saved are because their own choice, they have not chosen to follow him. That's right. And I would add too, I mean, uh, through the judgment, uh, we not only learn what others have done, what we ourselves have done, but we learn who God is, right? right. Uh, if you, you look back in the story of Genesis, uh, the, the temptation of Eve really was a question of, can you trust God? Uh, is God really telling you the truth or is he withholding something from you, right? It's a question of who God is. And at the end of time, we can see who he really is. We can see that he's fair, that he's just. And we understand uh, that he loves us so much, we'll have no desire to depart from him again, you see. And in scripture it says that sin will not rise a second time. Uh, after the second coming, after sin on this earth is done away with. The reason it won't come a second time isn't because we lose free choice. It's because we fully trust God. We have seen his judgments and fully trust him in his administration of the universe. Uh, God eternally secures the universe while preserving freedom of choice. Absolutely. Right? Fantastic. Why don't we go to another question? We got another question right over there. I was just wondering how capital punishment doesn't go against the sixth commandment of thou shalt not kill. Well, I am not in favor of uh, capital punishment here in our system on this earth. Um, I understand that there can be strong feelings on that topic, but it's always been my view uh, that when you take a life, it is such a final and um, uh, final act that we must uh, be very careful when we ourselves take on that claim. Now in scripture, uh, in that uh, heavenly r order, uh, we do find that God does administer uh, capital punishment. Um, but in that system, uh, we find that it's divinely directed, right? God is at the head of that system. But here on this earth, uh, we never truly know, like I was mentioning before, the inner thoughts of the heart. Uh, and there is always room uh, that there could be error. Uh, so I personally uh, am not in favor of capital punishment, uh, but I can under understand how people view it differently. Uh, but I would say though that even those who would support capital punishment, uh, ultimately that doesn't solve the problem, right? Now that offender, he cannot be a threat to society anymore, but that doesn't repair truly the harm that they caused, right? I mean, the, the loss and the pain that have been suffered at this offender's hands is still there, right? So that's where God's judgment comes in because he's not only holding those accountable for what they've done, but he's healing those who have suffered the loss from those actions. Wow. You know, it's, it's really fascinating as we're hearing this discussion, you know, a question comes up, which is, wait a minute, you, you know, we're called to forgive. Uh, we're called to let go of wrongs. Um, we're, we're called to operate in a way that's, uh, we're, we're called to be compassionate. But then when you enter into some of these systems, let's say the legal system, you work for the legal system, how does one maintain that, that code, those values of, of being like Christ, yet maintaining justice, upholding the law. How do you navigate through that? Are they contradictory to one another? Should, should Christians stay out of that? Well, I would, I would say that justice comes from love. I mean, if you truly love someone, you will desire justice. Uh, and it's not just the protection of the innocent, uh, but it's also coming from a love of the offender. I mean, God doesn't love you more uh, because you are doing the right thing. On the reverse, he doesn't love that person less because they're doing the wrong thing, right? His love for us is independent of what we do, right? And in his judgment, in upholding justice, uh, it is an act of love, not only to the victim, but to the offender. So when we look at the human context, you know, how can we um, put these principles into practice? We always must remember that, you know, God loves that person just as, us, as he loves me. So, you know, as a prosecutor, I look at uh, allowing opportunity for an offender to change their behavior, but it's ultimately their choice, right? Uh, you can uh, put someone in prison, 
but if their heart is unchanged, that's not really going to uh, affect them long term, right? But as a prosecutor, I try to give them the opportunity, maybe through probation, maybe through treatment courts, uh, to make the right decisions. But if they decide this is the path they've gone down, there's nothing I can do, uh, and they must uh, ultimately uh, have the consequence to protect others. That's right. Boundaries are needed at that moment. Mm -hmm. Dr. Davidson, would you add to that? Yeah, I mean, I do need to bring in Genesis 9, which is before Israel became a nation. This is the, one of the Noahide laws right after the flood, where it does say, whoever sheds man blood, man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. God here is trying to preserve the value of a human being. Mm -hmm. And it, sometimes in the Levitical law, there are cases that, that called for the, for the death penalty. Very, uh, very strict legal uh, stringencies were put upon that that made it very difficult to, to uh, prosecute someone. They had to have two or three witnesses that actually saw it and so forth. And so I, I would agree with you that the way our legal system is not today, I don't think we could actually pull it off in a just way as they could in the Old Testament times. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we, we can recognize the failings of our justice system. Um, and it, it makes sense that we aren't perfect in administering justice because we are perfect. It's an imperfect people trying to achieve uh, a just result. So I am just personally convicted where uh, offenders should be held accountable. They should have consequences for their actions. Uh, but to take the life of someone, uh, that I will leave to God and his ultimate justice in the end times. Wow, that's fascinating. Appreciate the insights here. We got another question right over there. Okay, so this is a question uh, I have that I'm sure this may be on the minds of a lot of people. So if nobody else speaks up about this, I'll do it for them. Um, so when we were young, a lot of times we were taught, you know, like if anyone does evil um, uh, against you, that leave it, um, you know, that God will take care of this person in the afterlife, for example. Now let's say, uh, so there's the belief of you follow Christ and he has died for your sins and we are imperfect people on this planet and that, you know, he will uh, forgive us. So let's say you have a kid born into a Christian family and he is, um, his parents did the best, give him the best, you know, quality life, education, food, shelter and everything from a young age. Uh, he went to church every uh, Sunday. He was involved in Bible study and so on, but in his 20s or something, this guy becomes mentally sick, mentally ill, whatever you want to call it, and he commits crimes like Jeffrey Dahmer. Now, either this guy gets caught and he hangs out in prison uh, three meals a day, does some push-ups, sit-ups, maybe plays basketball, and he dies like, I don't know, 60 years later, or this guy doesn't get caught. So him believing in Christ Will this guy be forgiven for his sins? If so, then how is this just and fair for the family members or the victims that suffered, you know, uh, that were on the receiving end of, of these horrible crimes? Yeah, I believe that part of the answer to this question, it's a difficult question, sensitive question, I acknowledge that, is that it's not enough to see, um, to give a simple, uh, you believe in Jesus and your sins are forgiven and that takes care of everything. Uh, that's why we have the judgment. That's why I see, I see the judgment as God having the opportunity to tell the full story of you and of this person you're describing. To show what was behind his circumstances and what led him to do, to, to lay open his his thinking and his directions and the influences that were involved with him so that we get a full picture of him because God is interested in not just a quick decision of guilty or not guilty, lost or saved. He wants to show, he wants to showcase the, the best in you. And so I'm, I, I, God, at the, God will at the same, same time as he wants to save everyone he can, he also has to preserve justice and he has to take care eventually of those who receive the consequences of these terrible things. 
And that's the beauty of what God is promising at the end that we don't know how to even fulfill here on earth is that he is promising, I will make everything right. That the judgment will bring a right-wising, a, 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 a satisfactory solution to all of those who have been oppressed. So in Revelation 6, you've got this group who have been martyred and they're crying, how long, O Lord, before you avenge our blood? And God says, wait till the judgment. I will make everything right, I promise you. And I don't know how he's going to do that, but he is, so that everyone will say, wow, he made it all right. And we can't do it in the human justice system. <clears throat> we don't know the full story of the human being, but once God shows the story, then it will be made clear to us what needs to happen, and then what needs to happen to the victims, that they are rewarded in a way that we can't even imagine that that happens. And so we're in a war zone now. This is a, a conflict between good and evil, between Satan and God. There's lots of innocent victims. We've got to realize that. But when the war is over, God is going to make everything right. And I have to trust to that. It's, 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 a, it's a great hope to me to know that we have a God big enough to be able to do that. You know, it's interesting as um, we're, we're talking about this idea of, of potentially deathbed confessions. Uh, you know, maybe someone like Jeffrey Dahmer or maybe a serial killer or, or some dictator, they, they operate their life in such a way of oppression and violence. At the very end, they decide, I'm going to come in to make sure I, I don't lose my way to heaven. Yeah. I'm going to confess all my sins at the very end and I'm going to get in, no problem. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the idea of it uh, is can be really um, disruptive to our concepts of, of justice and That's mercy right. that someone like this, that's right. Could get into it. But what I'm hearing is, wait a minute, we don't know the whole picture. And, and second of all, you know, when you read scripture, you do got an idea of a, a deathbed confession on the cross. You see the thief on the cross. Yeah. And maybe there might be some other examples like Manasseh, you know, as king who committed great crimes. But it also said he went through a period of repentance too. Yeah. Yeah. There was an attempt where he was undoing some of the wrongs that he committed. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, with, uh, I'm not God, but I can, you know, with Hitler, there is no evidence of repentance at the end of his life. There, there's absolutely nothing that indicated to anyone this man, you know, turned to Jesus at the end of his life, right? We don't, we don't see any of that there. Yeah. Andrew, what would you say? Well, I would say that, you know, those who uh, are in heaven aren't there because of their good works. Uh, it's always through the grace of Christ, right? So uh, our salvation uh, is always going to be dependent uh, upon our faith in Christ, uh, first and foremost. So when we look at people who've committed great crimes, uh, we have to recognize that my sin that I've committed, uh, I'm just as unworthy of going to heaven as someone else, right? There's nothing that I have done that merits my salvation, right? So we have to recognize we're all in the same boat, so to speak. We're all lost without Christ. So those who make um, a, a confession of faith, uh, Christ will look and see if they have that transformed heart. It's not just an utterance of, you know, Lord, forgive my sins, and now I'm Boom, I'm, no, I'm in, no, no problem. It, there's a process of reflecting Christ's character in your life, a process of conversion. Right. Uh, and I think what we lose sometimes is like the thief on the cross. Uh, we know that, uh, uh, at least according to scripture, there was a genuine confession there. Uh, and it appears in scripture that he will be among the saved. Uh, but we don't know that if he got down from that cross, what his life would have been. Right. Christ can see and God can see uh, everything into the future. He can see what that person would have done. And we have a very limited set of knowledge. So we got to uh, uh, be careful in condemning others, uh, though they have committed great wrongs, uh, that we ourselves are guilty of, of things that, you know, uh, as well. And to, at the end of the day, trust God that he will make it right, right? We have to trust God in the process because uh, ultimately uh, we'll find if we do that we will be satisfied with what he has chosen. That's right. Heaven's going to be full of surprises, but at the very end we'll affirm God's decision making and his actions in that justice. And that's why the Bible says just and true 
are all, you in all your ways, right? He, he declares that one day creation is going to say this, not because they're forced to, but because they have seen the evidence. Mm -hmm. God has been transparent. Yeah. Wow. We got another question right over there. How does an ordinary person who say doesn't work in the legal profession bring justice in God's eyes to their everyday life? And I think this is a great question because the Bible does tell the believer to carry out justice, like you quoted from Micah, to be just. Mm -hmm. How does that work? Let's say you're not a police officer. Let's say you're not a prosecutor. Let's say you're not a judge. You don't work in the legal system. How does one carry out justice in their day-to-day -day life? Well, I think you find principles in Scripture that are universal. Uh, fairness, truth, equity, uh, mercy, uh, those sort of principles uh, can be uh, applicable to any kind of situation, right? And uh, at least from the scriptural context, we're called to be peacemakers, right? We're called to be repairers of the breach. So we should go out and try to amend the, the wrongs that we see in society. So you don't have to be in the legal profession to do justice. Uh, you can do justice in any aspect of life. If you're showing those attributes of and justice and mercy and love and equity, um, you are uh, helping to achieve justice in that circumstance, you see? That's right, you're, you're being the hands and feet of Jesus. Right? Exactly. Uh, Dr. Would, Davidson, I, what would you add to that? I would just say amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I think we got time for one more question. Right over there. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you thought that some laws are actually unjust based on God's will, and if so, should those laws be enforced? So I think we are called, um, as Christians, uh, we are called to uh, uphold and to follow the laws of the country we are in, except in the circumstance where they contradict God's law. So uh, we are called in every circumstance to obey God, no matter what. Uh, and for the most part, most human laws are at least compatible with God's law. Most societies say you can't kill or steal, which is compatible, obviously, with, with God's law. Uh, but there are circumstances uh, which a law is not just unjust, but it goes against God's design. And in those situations, we are obviously called to follow, follow God, regardless of the human consequence. But I think we have to be careful in uh, distinguishing those types of situations, where there's a conflict between man's law and God's law, with laws we just don't like. Right. There's a lot of laws we may not appreciate. Like Maybe the speed limit. Speed limits, right? Uh, <laughs> many people, don't tell me if you have, have broken the law uh, by speeding, right? That's just, that just happens all the time. Uh, and we may not like that law, but as Christians, we're still called to follow it, you see. Uh, that's a different situation where there might be a true conflict between the laws of man and the laws of God. And in that situation, like Daniel, we have to follow God regardless of the consequences to ourselves. Fantastic. Really, again, just appreciate this discussion. I think uh, we've jumped into the ideas of justice and judgment, and I appreciate just even some of the understanding we've gained of the legal system during it, this it, time, right? It's great to have someone that understands the legal system come and talk about the Bible. That's right. I, I, I love to go to the different, uh, different professions and ask them about the Bible because they have their perspective that opens it up through their eyes that we don't have. We're not legal experts. That's right. So, thank you. <laughs> and it's going to be a, a discussion for eternity, right? right? So if you've ever been misjudged or mistreated, there is good news. There will be a time at the end where all wrongs will be made right. And our God, who is a God of justice and fairness, will pronounce judgment on those who have been perpetrators of injustice. But if you've ever misjudged, mistreated, or wronged someone else, there is good news for you too. The story is told of a difficult final exam that students in a class had to take. It was known to be the hardest of all examinations, and all students in that class dreaded the time when it was to come. To make it a little bit easier for his students, the professor allowed the students to bring in a small paper into the exam room with them. They could use anything on that paper to help them out in the exam. The students gladly took the papers and started cramming in smallest writing possible all the notes they could possibly squeeze on that paper. The day of the exam came and all the students arrived at their desks with their papers covered in tiny writing, except for one student. 
He came in with a blank sheet of paper, put it on the floor, and invited his older brother, who had passed the class before, to come on in, stand on the paper, and tell all the answers he needed. The judgment at the end of time is like that exam. No matter how hard we try, we can never live up to God's perfect standards. The good news is, if we humbly confess our sins and ask, Jesus will come in and stand on that paper in our place and help us to pass. And that is great news. Do you think the judgment is good news? Follow us on Facebook at Hope at Night and let us know there. Take care and see you next week on Hope at Night.